Hello, thanks for tuning in on this video discussion. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to write while you're reading manuscripts. So the title of this video is Think Like a Scientist, how to, how to take notes while reading manuscripts. For those who don't know me, I am Dr. Esiosa Igadaro, and I am a neurologist, a PhD trained neuroscientist, and also a health advocate. To make sure you subscribe to my channel so you can stay up to date on all of the great pearls and jewels that I give on this channel for graduate students, medical students, pre-med students on how to, or some of the skills that you guys need to be able to succeed in your various careers. So this video is gonna be talking about reading and this can be a very daunting task. I know it was for me when I first started. So I obtained my MD PhD at the University of Kentucky. And when I started graduate school, so I did two years of med school, four years of graduate school, then two years of med school, again, for a total of an eight year program. So when I, after I finished my second year of medical school, I went to graduate school and I was so excited to you know, finally be in the lab and be able to, be a scientist. And in the first week of graduate school, when I was in the lab, my phenomenal mentor, Dr. Nelson, you know, said, okay, it's time for you to start reading. And he, you know, gave me a, a handful of papers and I was overwhelmed. I had never really read a manuscript before. I didn't know how to approach it. I, so it took me a while to be able to figure out my figure out a good system for me that was efficient and effective. So I'm going to give you that secret that I use and that I discovered and that I still use today while I'm writing my own manuscripts so that you don't waste time. You're efficient, you're effective, you remember what you read, and you can start taking what you read and publishing your own first author papers, which is one of the goals in science. So Let's get started. So when you are asked to read, many of your mentors will tell you before you can even start writing a paper, they want you to read. The first step that you want to do is figure out what is your purpose for reading. So what I'm going to be doing as we're talking is I am going to be writing out my steps because I'm a very visual person. And these are the things that you guys want to take away from, from this video. So let me get situated and write out the first step. The first step is step one. What is your purpose for reading? So at this stage, early on, most of you your purpose for reading is to learn the field. So you're basically trying to learn, get as much background as you need in order to start reading more papers in detail. So for example, my research topic was on small vessel disease. It was on the blood vessels in the brain and trying to understand what are some of the different blood vessel pathologies that are correlated with cognitive deficits in the elderly human brain. So that's what I worked on. So coming out of medical school, I knew I know what a blood vessel looks like and I know what a brain looks like. That's pretty much as much as I knew coming out of um, my second year of medical school. So the purpose for me was to really just understand the vocabulary, understand the jargon, understand the field of cerebrovascular disease and vascular cognitive impairment. So your step one, or step one is to figure out what is the purpose for reading and try to narrow down the topics that you're gonna be reading for. So for me, I was gonna be reading for cerebrovascular disease and to get more specific, cerebrovascular disease due to small vessel pathologies. And then the second thing I was going to read is cognitive impairment. So those were two big categories of topics that I was going to read initially. So I urge you all who's listening to figure out what's the purpose. For many people, it would be to learn the field. And then afterwards, you want to, you want to be able to narrow that 
purpose down to specific topics that are manageable when you go on to start reading. Now we are going to get into step two of the, of my process. So let's write that out for you. So step two is to create an outline for your notes. So many of you are like, why do I need to create an outline? Why can I just not start reading? Because if you read, some of these papers are 20 pages long. So if you sit there and you read that those 20 pages, a week from now, are you going to remember anything that came out of what you read? Most of us, I know I could not. And when I started, and you're not just going to be reading one paper, you're going to be reading 10, 20, 30 papers. And how are you going to keep all the papers straight? And so to be more efficient, you want to maximize your time by reading and also taking notes while you're reading. Now, it's not going to be the same as taking notes when you're in medical school or when you're in college or high school, where you're just, you know, taking notes for a different purpose, you're going to be taking, you're going to be more strategic in how you take notes and creating your outline is going to help you be strategic. So I will show you guys one of the outlines that I used or that I created when I was early on in my graduate career. So I'll show you guys this document here. So this is a document that I used when I was first starting out in graduate school. So the purpose of this document, I was interested in um, reviewing small vessel disease, in particular brain arterial sclerosis is a type of small vessel disease pathology. So because I wanted to just, I wanted to understand this field, I came up with an outline and your mentors can kind of help you with this outline. And so some of the things that I needed to know for the field were that there are many kinds of cerebrovascular small vessel disease. So that's what's highlighted here. And these here are all the references and we'll, we'll get into the references later, but the outline is what's highlighted in green. So I wanted to figure out what are the types of cerebral vascular small vessel disease number one. And then the next thing was, what does brain arterial sclerosis even mean? So I wanted to come up, I wanted to really understand the definitions because there's many different um, scientists that had variations of this definition. So that's why this is important here. And there's, you know, Bisswanger's disease is a specific kind of small vessel disease that's really prominent. So I wanted, so I made that its own topic, um, you know, terminologies, frequency, better trying to understand and characterize this brain vessel pathology in the brain. You know, what are some of the diagnosis? How do we diagnose this in in the hospital or how do we diagnose it at autopsy because this is a brain pathology. So I just really wanted to make sure that I fully understood brain arterial sclerosis. And you know, what are the, what's the pathology? Why do some people get this pathology? So that's why I have risk, risk factors here. What's the imaging that's used in, in medicine? There's different kinds of imaging that can be used to get at this, uh, brain vessel abnormality. And also what are some of the clinical consequences? And some of the clinical consequences, you know, are listed here, but this was part of my outline. And then what are some other co-pathologies for this brain arterial sclerosis, staging, animal models, biomarkers, etc. So your outline is not going to look like this, but for me, the things highlighted in green were big subcategories for me to fully understand before I could say that I was an expert in brain arterial sclerosis. So what I would suggest is once you have your topic defined, defined then you want to figure out <clears throat> what is it about that topic that I, that I need to know early on in the beginning. And once you write that down, you won't have you won't have this filled out yet. What you'll have is just a series of um, subcategories here, which are the ones that are highlighted in green. 
And you can think on that for maybe a couple of hours, chew on it on your own. And then once you think you have a good, once you think you have good subcategories, subtopics, then you can run that by the, your seniors that are in your lab or in part of your group or run it by your mentor just to make sure that you're reading appropriately. So I'm gonna minimize this. <clears throat> so once you have your outline, that's what you're gonna be using to take your note, to help you guide on what notes that you'll be taking as you're reading. And we can talk about how to take the specific notes later in a different video. So what's next? So once you have your outline, step three is collecting, or it's for you to collect the articles of interest that will help you, that will help provide information for you for the subcategories, like the ones that were highlighted in green for me. So this is a SAP category. What are the type of small vessel diseases? Then I will need to go find articles that talk about small vessel diseases. And early on in this stage, it's always really good to read review articles because review articles, especially those that are, those that are recent, kind of give you a comprehensive understanding of the field. And your mentors are very great at giving you those kind of articles. So don't feel like you have to go find these on your own. Many of the mentors that I've worked with on you know, various projects are phenomenal in giving me you know, these big, um, uh, what's the word, big comprehensive articles. And sometimes if they're not able to give you articles, they can give you names of authors that you can go look up in PubMed and now that's and PubMed is one of the resources that we use, at least in biomedical um, science, and it may be different for specific fields, depending on what field you're in. But most of the time, your mentors can give you the papers that he or she recommends that you start reading first. And make sure that you want you want to read the review articles first, and then you can look at you know more specific primary articles. So you collect these articles, you can, again, get them from your mentor or you get them from other people in the lab, which would be ideal in my opinion. So once you collect your articles, now we're gonna go on to step four, which is to organize your articles. And this is key. There are many different ways to organize your articles. There are some people who print every single article out and that's a lot of paper, but to each their own. I'm a, I am someone who loves um, technology and I'm always trying to find ways to be efficient, effective. And I love carrying my iPad and being able to have all of my notes in one place. So that's one system that I use. I, you know, um, use OneNote and I, you know, print out my articles into one note and then I can take notes within, or I can highlight, I'm trying to pull up a paper that I used so I can show you guys an example of what I am talking about. Okay, this is a good example. So here's one note for some, for those of you who don't know what one note is, I love it. And this is one of the papers that came out of my, um, my lab. And so what I did is I got the PDF and I printed it into OneNote and I can access this OneNote from any computer, my phone, my iPad, anywhere. And I can even highlight, you know, depending on what color I want, you know, I could just sit and highlight and, you know, the whole, P the whole, article is here and I can continue to print out different articles and then they, they would all be listed on this side right here. So I love OneNote for that. Other systems that other of my colleagues have used are that they will print out the PDFs and save them onto a folder. So here I have many different folders, you know, Alzheimer's, blood vessels, diabetes, 
um, hypertension. These are all folders relevant to my project. And so some, when I get an article, if I don't want to save it into my OneNote, then I just, you know, create a folder and I put it in its respect in its respective um, subfolder. So here are some of the articles that I've saved that talk about Alzheimer's disease. So that's one system that people use. I think the more efficient system to use now is EndNote. So EndNote is a program that allows you to be able to keep track of all of your research articles. And it also helps you format your reference page. And this will become, this will be important when you go to write your paper and when you go to start citing the content in your paper. And we'll talk about that in a different video. And for those of you who are not familiar with references, this is my first author paper. Look at my name in print. Doesn't it just look so pretty? Oh, I'm so excited. Um, this was published in 2016. This is on brain arterial sclerosis. So let me just show you guys what the re the reference references look like. Let me keep scrolling. Look at all those beautiful images. So these these are the references, and they have a specific format, and the format is different for specific journals. So many people used EndNote, and your mentors are are going to be familiar with this program to keep track of their articles and their references. And a great thing with EndNote is that you can embed your PDF into OneNote, or sorry, you can embed your PDF into the EndNote so that if you're looking for a specific article, instead of saving it on OneNote or saving it in subfolders on your hard drive, you can just save it into the OneNote, keep all your references and your PDFs in one place, and you can just access it from there. So that would be my advice is to really use OneNote, keep your PDFs in OneNote, sorry, I'm getting OneNote and EndNote confused because it's EndNote, OneNote, they probably did that on purpose. Anywho, my advice would be to save all of your PDFs in EndNote because that's your citation manager and the, everything's in one place and it's you have easy access and you can highlight and whatnot. So, and I can talk more about EndNote in a separate video, but that's just find your system, find your system of how to organize your notes. You can ask your colleagues, you can ask your professors, you can ask your mentors, just figure out your, your, figure out a system. And after you figure out your system, then step five, uh, step five for me is the fun, is the most fun step. Step five is to optimize your reading space. So what do I mean by optimizing your reading space? For me, taking time to read was very difficult because, you know, I reading is not something that always was fun for me. So, and as a scientist, you have to do a lot of reading if you want to be able to master the field and then also design informed studies and then publish. So you have to do a lot of reading. So in order to make reading less unbearable, I created a reading space for myself, whether it's in my lab or at home or in the library, I would always try to create, create um, a personalized reading space that I liked, that I was comfortable with, that could help, that could promote my focus so I can read longer. So for example, what I've started using is a diffuser, a diffuser that changes colors because I'm really into different smells and colors and light. So when I go to read, I have my diffuser running. And then I also have, um, you know, sometimes I have a candle or I'll, I love playing music in the background. I love playing music without words. Um, so it just kind of helps me like focus and I have my different playlists on Spotify and, it, you know, I can also try out, you know, new playlists and new songs as well. So just whatever you do, make sure you create your reading space, you optimize it, make sure you're comfortable, sit on your favorite chair or sit in your, sit on your favorite um, seat cushion. What else do people like to have? Or have your favorite be beverage, have a little snack, you know, beside you, just create a space that's comfortable for you so that you're more likely to read. Also, what you want to do is set a timer because that will help you keep yourself accountable. You know, there's 
you can, you know, talk to your mentor, depending on the work that you have done, you know, maybe you want to aim for reading for four hours a day or three hours a day, depending on, you know, the work that you have to do. You really want to set that timer so that you know that every day you're reading for this much. Because sometimes if you don't set the timer, then it's hard to keep yourself accountable and you can lose track of time. And I think, you know, 12 hours will go by and what did you really, you know, have done? So you can set a timer or you can make a goal for yourself to maybe read two papers a day or read one paper a day, whatever it is. Um, just make sure you have an accountability system that is incorporated into trying to optimize your, your reading space. And last but not least is step six. Now we get to start reading and taking notes. Woohoo, it's so exciting. We finally get to start reading and learn about our topic and we're getting to be an expert. That's also a fun part too. So how, how, so now we're gonna put all the pieces together and we're gonna get to start reading. So I'll pull up a simple article. Of course, I'm gonna pull up mine cause it's the best. So let's say your mentors gives you a stack of papers and they say, okay, read these stack of papers. So what I like to do, I, I love split screens. So I put this article on this side and then I have my Word document on the other side. And my Word document is where I contained, where I contain all of my um, outline, where my outline will be. And then I start reading. So as I'm reading, if I see, if we scroll down here, we'll see where I talk about the definition of brain arteriosclerosis. Let's see if we can find it. Okay, so here it is. So I can highlight this. Ooh, they have colors now. They didn't have colors on in, in this program when I was in grad school. So you guys are lucky. Okay, so this all, oh, this is a, you know, a good, interesting high yield point for me. You know, what is brain arterial sclerosis? Well, here it's defined here. So then what I would do, because, oh, look, that was one of my sub topics, definitions of brain arterial sclerosis. So then what I do is I would write the article. So when you're referencing articles, at least when you're taking notes, you can just say the last name and all, if it's more than one person, what year? So this was in 2016, what journal? This is in Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism. And then you can paraphrase the, what did the information. So some people paraphrase, some people, you know, copy and paste, you can do whatever works for you, but know that when you go to actually write the paper, you never want to copy verbatim someone else's words because that is plagiarism and you do not want that in your paper and your paper will be rejected. So for your notes, you can either copy and paste for your notes or you can paraphrase. I like the paraphrase. So then here, I would just, you know, paraphrase and then keep reading. And if I find any more information I think is important or pertinent, then I would highlight it and then put it in the respective category. And then I'm done with that paper. And then I file it back into EndNote and then I go on to the next paper. And after you read all those 20 papers or 30 papers that your mentor wanted you to read, now you have a full... Now you have this note, you have this document that has all of this just great information. You have the references, you have, um, you know, what they talked about. And this is your guide to 
whenever you now, when you want to go back and make a presentation or when you want to start writing a paper or you want to design your study, you can go back and, you know, take a look at your notes and you can go back and take a look not only at the notes, but you can also go back to the specific paper that you reference for more reading. And it just makes your reading more efficient. It makes you look like a superstar and you get, you get to, you know, do more, more out of your time. So that is how I take notes while reading my manuscripts. So in the next upcoming videos, I will go into detail about creating your outline, about organizing your notes, talking about EndNote. So be sure you subscribe to my channel. Make sure you click that subscribe button so that you can get more pearls. Because So you can get some more pearls because science is fun. Research is fun. There is these tasks that we have to do. And this is why, this is what makes us the expert. And it can be very daunting in the beginning. But if you approach it from a strategic standpoint, you will do phenomenal. So I look forward to see or to um to discuss with you all online and also in the next video and keep reading keep thriving keep discovering until next time i'm dr estiosa egadaro